So let's have fun listing the top five US sitcoms in my DVD collection. This top five has been decided by me alone, but future videos in this series will be decided by you in regular community polls for subscribers to my channel. So let's start at number five in my list with a sitcom that lit up my Friday nights throughout much of the 1980s, but which has been somehow diminished for me by one of its very own spin-offs. Let's reminisce to the classic theme and scenes from a legendary sitcom. For a show that became such a phenomenal worldwide success, it's a surprising fact that Cheers was almost cancelled in its first season due to low ratings. Its 80s setting was a Boston bar owned by ex-baseball star Sam Malone. Alcohol actually eats huge holes in the tissue of your... Uh... Look, you know, some people like bartenders who tell great stories and jokes. <laughs> I'm sorry, you guys. Hello, everybody. Malone was a compulsive womanizer and a recovering alcoholic, played by Ted Danson. He would soon meet his match in the shape of snobbish and overeducated Diane Chambers, who takes a job as a waitress after being abandoned at the bar by her ex-lover. Probably still remember where the office is, right? Oh, yes. I've seen it in my dreams. Huh. Coach, I'm going to take a break here. The dazed and confused coach and the razor-tongued Carla Tortelli were both staff at the bar. Thank God I don't have an alcoholic personality. You don't have a personality. <laughs> I'm, I'm over, over you. you. You're, You're over, over me. me. Sam and Diane were polar opposites, but were strongly attracted to each other. <laughs> other regular characters were customers Norm Peterson and Cliff Clevin. Coach, I think something we thought we'd seen the last of is just about to resurface. Yeah, my lunch. Sadly, we would soon see the end of Coach, played by Nicholas Colasanto, who would succumb to heart problems in 1985. His replacement would be none other than Woody Harrelson, a virtual unknown back then, but who is now one of the most famous film stars in the world. Excuse me, my name's Woody Boy. Woody? Hi, I'm Sam Malone. Howdy. The troubled on-off relationship between Sam and Diane would be the sitcom's main focus for its first five seasons. But even after Shelley Long left the show in 1987, it continued to go from strength to strength. Long was replaced at the bar by Kirsty Alley, playing the character Rebecca Howe, another romantic target for Sam Malone. And yes, that is John Mahoney, who would play Fraser Crane's dad in the Cheers spin-off show, Fraser. Hey babe, you can't work with a man you're attracted to? Oh, God. <laughs> the show's final episode in 1993 was a huge TV event, attracting more than 40 million US households to a feature-length episode that saw the return of Shelley Long as Diane. Thanks for staying, guys. Same to you. Wouldn't be the same without you, Sam. Yeah. Whatever guy followed you, Sam, got some pretty big shoes to fill. And so to number four in our list, a sitcom that launched the career of Michael J. Fox and featured three appearances by a very young Tom Hanks at the very beginning of his illustrious career. Two free-thinking 1960s hippies get married and raise three children in the greed-driven decade of the 1980s. That's what the sitcom Family Ties is all about, and its comedy is drawn from a reverse clash of attitudes where the children are conservative and the parents are liberal. The parents are Stephen and Elise Keaton, who both try their level best to be true to their liberal values amid the consumer boom of the 1980s, while their children happily lap up all the excesses of Reaganomics. Their son, Alex, is the most conservative of the Keaton children, played by a young Michael J. Fox in this season one episode titled The Fugitive. Now, Uncle Ned may be impulsive, but you got to remember one thing. He's the junior vice president of the Sintram Corporation. Fox laced the opinionated character of Alex with layers of charm to make him irresistibly likable, and he would be the show's biggest draw. His claim to movie fame in Back to the Future was still over two years away when this episode aired, but his performances in Family Ties would have the film's producers bending over backwards to give him the role of Marty McFly. And Alex's Uncle Ned would be played by a megastar of the future in the shape of Tom Hanks. Oh, my God. Oh, who's the little monkey <laughs> This would be the first of three appearances in the show as Elise's brother, just before his big screen career began to take off. If I got a surprise for you, you will never guess who just came for a visit. <laughs> and it isn't long before Ned starts to display some very odd behavior with phone calls. Repeat, the Falcon has landed. 
The fat man walks alone. So you're sure about those chopped chives? I, I don't understand. Why are they after you? When questioned by Elise, Ned explains that he was fired from his job for refusing to close down a profitable company to make vast profits on a tax write-off. His conscience was pricked by the 1,800 workers that would lose their jobs in the unnecessary closure. But later, it would be revealed that Ned wasn't telling the whole story after the Keaton household is visited by a Columbo-like FBI agent when Ned is absent. Uncle Ned stole four and a half million dollars. <coughs> Whoa! <laughs> Oh, I appreciate that you gave me the benefit of the doubt. But we only lied because we knew you wouldn't do something like that. Thanks. Did you steal the money, Ned? Yes. <laughs> when Ned returns to the Keaton family home, he explains that he didn't steal the money for himself, but that he stole it to stop the merger that would lead to the company closure and save those 1,800 jobs. He hid the money in the company's password-protected computer. Like all the best American sitcoms, Family Ties does not shy away from drama. The stress of hiding the family fugitive sparks arguments between Ned and his hosts. We didn't break the law, Ned. Oh, no? Why were you in jail during the Democratic Convention of 68? You couldn't get a hotel room? <laughs> it's not the same thing. Of course it's the same thing. It was just fashionable when you did it. Even Alex is disappointed with his idol. I began to realize there is something very wrong built into the whole corporate structure. Bite your tongue. <laughs> And Steve and Elise argue over Ned during a sleepless night. Well, we can't turn him away now. The stakes are too high. And Ned is not a child, Elise. Yes, he is. In many ways, he's still a child. That's because you treat him like one. The next day, after a failed attempt by Ned to get on a flight as far away from his pursuers as possible, he again returns to his sister's family home and asks if it's all right to stay a while longer. No, that's not all right. Why not? Now, you don't understand this, do you? you? You don't need a big sister anymore. You need a lawyer. I begged you to go to law school. <laughs> you are not a kid anymore. For God's sakes, will you please grow up? Ned tries to leave on foot again, but his sister's wise words cause a change of heart. He returns to the house to face the music and an FBI arrest. OK, Ned, get your things. We're going downtown. I've always wanted to say that. <laughs> Who knows, Elisa, I may just grow up yet. I think maybe you already have. I love you, Ned. I love you too. Any sitcom that can assemble such a fine collection of actors and writers and help launch the careers of megastars like Tom Hanks and Michael J. Fox is a worthy addition to my DVD collection. Family Ties would win five Emmy Awards during its seven season run. Three of those would deservedly go to Michael J. Fox as best actor in a comedy. And now for the third sitcom in our list, a show that was a shining star of Rupert Murdoch's Fox TV network in its early days. Welcome to the nightmare world of Al and Peg Bundy. Is this your little cactus? Uh-huh. Any particular reason you put it where the alarm clock used to be? <laughs> unhappily married for too many years and now locked in a relationship that's fueled by mutual disrespect, mockery and loathing. Al, do you have to leave the refrigerator door open? I'm getting a draft. I'm sorry. Maybe I should look for some food in the dishwasher. The pilot episode of this 1980s comedy sets the tone perfectly for what will be an 11 season run. Those kids. I hate wasting food. <laughs> making the show one of the longest-running sitcoms in the history of the Fox television network. Have a nice day, honey. I don't care what your little ruler says. I've been a seven since I graduated from high school. Al is a reluctant shoe store salesman who often takes out his unhappiness on his unfortunate customers. Very fresh. Because for the last hour, I've been trying to squeeze your foot into a shoe when I really should have been easing them into the box. Come on, Arnold. We're leaving. I want a blue. You've already got one. <laughs> the Bundys have two kids. Young Bud, who's shrewd and sharp beyond his years. You want to know who Kelly was with this afternoon? And his teenage sister, Kelly, who is a serial dater of any teen boy that her father dislikes. Nobody. Does nobody have a name? You know, Tom, Dick, Cobra with a sore on his mouth. 
Dad, it's not that kind of a sore. He just fell asleep with a cigar in his mouth. The next fractured pillar of the Bundys' world is their snobbish newly married neighbours, Marcy and Steve Rhodes. Are you implying that it's my fault you have no friends? Oh, no. It's me who sits in front of the TV set burping with my hand thrust down my pants. <laughs> These unfortunate new neighbours become a plaything for Al and Peg. Howdy, neighbour! Yeah, yeah, yeah. I hate these pigs. <laughs> Their fresh and optimistic outlook on marriage needs to be corrected. Hey, listen, who do you like to win the NBA championship this year? I don't watch much sports. Marcy doesn't like it, and we decided we'll only do things we both like. I'll get us some coffee, Marcy. And the Bundys happily take them under their protective wing. a lot of coffee you're putting in there? Yes. I used to love sports. Of course you did. You're a man. To show them the error of their innocent ways. And Steve, you can love it again. You see, if they enjoy eating and drinking at home too much, they never take you anywhere. And to remodel them in their own image. <laughs> With men, if you ask them for something, you are never going to get it. But if you do some damage to their internal organs, you got a shot. This sitcom has never failed to make me laugh in all of its 259 episodes. Steve! If you get a chance to stream it, just give the pilot a try and see where it leads you. Oh, nice shot. Yeah. <laughs> And now to the second place title in our list, a sitcom that even had people marching in the streets back in the late 1970s. This is the story of two sisters, Jessica Tate and Mary Campbell. This sitcom was cutting edge for its time, and it managed to court controversy even before its debut in 1977. The Tates have more secrets than they do money. Its plot lines included alien abduction, demonic possession, extramarital affairs, kidnapping, murder, organized crime, and communist revolution. What more could you possibly ask from a comedy? I was still at school in the late 70s, and I don't remember all of those story threads clearly, but I do remember looking forward to watching this half hour of madness every week after the 10 o'clock news. Each episode would be a major talking point for me and my friends the day after. Soap ran for four seasons on US television, and that was a miracle in itself because the critics were out to get it from the start. The press of the day stirred the church and TV decency activists to protest about what they saw as its immoral and indecent storylines. Soon the host network itself was on the producer's back with a seemingly endless raft of internal memos, including one which stated, Corinne's affair with a Jesuit priest, her subsequent pregnancy as a result and later exorcism are all unacceptable. Fortunately for us, the producer completely ignored that memo. The show borrowed its premise from the American daytime soaps of the day, including As the World Turns and Days of Our Lives. Cleverly, though, it wasn't just a spoof of them. It also borrowed their dramatic license, which made soap something far more than just another sitcom. And I remember as many dramatic moments from the show as I do funny ones. You were my child. And you were no less my child than had you come from my womb. Soap's catalogue of memorable characters included the apparently dizzy but often perceptive Jessica Tate. It's worse for them because everybody wants their autographs. So far, nobody's asked me for mine. But if they do, I've decided to keep it really quite simple. Just something like, best wishes, Jessica Tate. Then there was the gender-confused Jodie Dallas, played by a young Billy Crystal. Bert Campbell was the blundering father of several sons in the show, including Chuck and Bob. <laughs> Calling my dead son an idiot. Oh, I'm sorry. A dead idiot. <laughs> and let's not forget the forgetful major. All the help on the block started a pool. Good. In the summer, the troops can go swimming. <laughs> And we certainly can't forget the sarcastic and pleasingly disrespectful butler of the Tate household, Benson. You want meaning in that? <laughs> Robert Guillaume would soon get his own spin-off show, ultimately stepping up to a job as the state governor's head of household and then to a role as assistant governor. Soap was abruptly cancelled after four successful seasons. 
The reason for the cancellation has never been clear, but I do remember reading news reports at the time linking the cancellation to popular president Ronald Reagan's dislike of the show. And so to that spin-off that I mentioned earlier, a vehicle for one of the favorite characters in Cheers. Thanks for staying, guys. Same to you. Successful spin-offs are a rarity, and ones that become even more successful than the original are almost unheard of. Frasier managed to achieve just that with its spin-off from Cheers in the 1990s. Created by David Angel, Peter Casey and David Lee, their show would move the character of Frasier as far from that Boston bar as they could, all the way to Seattle, in fact. They would set him against the unfamiliar backdrop of a radio station and an apartment that would become a nest for family members that the Frasier of Cheers twice denied the existence of. This new setting would help to flesh out and distinguish the character from the comparative shadow of itself that graced that Boston bar, and the show's creators would summon a brand new cast of compelling characters through which Frasier would shine. Most of the regular cast for Frasier weren't even auditioned. They were gifted the roles because the creators simply knew that they were perfect for them. But casting the character of Roz Doyle was far more problematic, perhaps because they sensed that she was more pivotal to the cast than even they had first thought. When you're the centerpiece of a show, you have to be a little more grounded. And no one could ground Frazier quite like Ros Doyle could. You dropped two commercials, you left a total of 28 seconds of dead air, you scrambled the station's call letters, you spilled yogurt on the control board, and you kept referring to Jerry with the identity crisis as Jeff. <laughs> she may not be as well educated as Frazier, but she is a veteran, she knows all the ropes, she has it on him, and she can make him just humiliate him you know, if she needs to, there. Stand toe to toe. Can absolutely yeah. stand toe to toe. But Perry Gilpin was not the original Ros Doyle. That role was given to Lisa Kudrow before the creators changed their minds, and Kudrow was free to find a more suitable role in Friends. Another masterstroke by the creators was to make Frasier's younger brother even more pompous than himself. No, thank you. This gave Frasier the chance to appear almost normal by comparison. The role was perfect for the brilliant David Hyde Pierce. And uh, so I thought, well, I hope this turns out well. I knew that Kelsey was going to be doing it. I heard they might be able to get John Mahoney, whose work I knew. But when I finally got the script, I was totally depressed because I thought, well, what? They've, they've written the same character as Frasier all over again. Why would you have two of the same guy? Which shows you just how smart I am. In the pilot episode, the brothers are faced with the problem of a partially disabled father who could no longer live on his own without supervision. Golden Acres. We care, so you don't have to. <laughs> It says that. Well, it might as well. And it's Frazier who volunteers to look after his father. All right, I'll make up the spare bedroom. Oh, you're a good son, Frazier. Oh, God, I am, aren't I? <laughs> but there was a problem with having both a brother and a living father, because the Frazier crane of Cheers had stated that his father was a research scientist who had passed away, and that he was also an only child. This blot on the landscape would be brushed over when Cheers characters guested on the show, and Frazier would admit to lying about his father and brother. Frasier's father, Martin Crane, would be played by seasoned actor John Mahoney, an actor with a very interesting personal history. David Angel, David Lee, and Peter Casey uh, called me and said, we'd love you to play Frasier's dad. And, and in the meantime, Kelsey was calling me at home in Chicago and saying, please play my dad, please play my dad. I thought John Mahoney would be perfect for the father. And so he was, especially in episodes where his son's snobbishness got out of hand and he needed a dressing down. I'm expecting to give up my study, the place where I read, where I do my most profound thinking. I use the can like the rest of the world. <laughs> but what Martin Crane needed himself was a personal assistant to compensate for his disability. Oh, hello. Caught me with me hand in the biscuit tin. <laughs> I'm Daphne, Daphne Moon. Enter Jane Leaves, who found initial fame as one of Hill's angels in the Benny Hill show. After moving stateside, she found modest but regular work in a string of TV dramas and comedies. Perhaps you should start by telling us a little bit about yourself, Miss Moon. Well, I'm originally from Manchester, England. Oh, really? Did you hear that, dear? I'm three feet away. There's nothing wrong with my hair. <laughs> John and I became immediate friends because we, we both had similar backgrounds. I didn't know it, but he's English. Um, you know, he was born and raised in Manchester, where my character's from. So he was, you know, it was great having him around. John Mahoney was actually born in Blackpool, but that's only because his family were evacuated from Manchester during World War II. At 18, he moved to the United States and served in the U.S. Army, for which he would perfect his American accent because he didn't want to stand out as a foreigner. In Frasier, as with all the great American sitcoms, drama is never far away. Well, I had plans too, you know. 
And this may come as a shock to you, Sonny Boy, but one of them wasn't living with you. In my opinion, American sitcoms are the best in the world at blending comedy and drama. They do it so fluidly and naturally that it often elevates a show from being the mere product of a genre at all. Well, I've done my best to make a home here for you. And once, just once, would it have killed you to say thank you? One lousy thank you. This pilot episode would be the start of an 11-season award-winning run for one of the greatest sitcoms of all time. That troubled father-son relationship would be a prime focus in that first season, adding layers of depth to the characters of Frasier and Martin Crane. Its other characters would grow in depth too throughout. I invite you to subscribe for more top five list videos in the future on a broad range of films and TV shows. And let me know your thoughts on these sitcoms in the comments. Thanks for watching.